So before we even get into the theories that you lay out in the book, which I find are fascinating, I think a big question is, and I was surprised by it too, why publish a book about this before the trial? It's Marty. a very good question, something I gave a lot of thought to. What I've done, and this is my 16th book, I was reported at the New York Times, I wrote for Vanity Fair as a contributing editor for a lot of years, and what I do is I tell true stories, but I tell stories. And I think this is a, an important story with a beginning, a middle, and an end right now. Uh, the subtitle of the book is The Requiem for the Idaho Student Murders, and it's a story that's supposed to be a loving remembrance of these children who've lost their lives. It's also a police thriller in many ways, a procedural of how the police caught this man. And it's really an answer uh, to a puzzle uh, of, of what happened. And I'm able to tell it really as a cross country journey that the father and son take. And in this journey where I was able to get some new information, uh, I lay out a story that aspires to be a narrative that uh, people can enjoy. So I thought now's the time to write about Let, it. Let's talk about that puzzle. So one of the big pieces of this book is you have a theory as to why, if Brian Koberger really did do this, who he was targeting. What, what can you tell us about that? Well, first, you know, emphasize what you said. It's my theory, my suspicion. Right. The prosecution and defense, one of the few things they agree on is that there was never, never any interaction between Koberger, either in person or on social media, uh, with any of the victims. I say that's perhaps not so true. If one looks at the course of what happened that night, Koberger enters the house on the second floor through the kitchen sliding door. There are two bedrooms right adjacent to the kitchen. He could have gone into either of those bedrooms. Instead, he pursues as if a man on the mission up a narrow staircase and goes into Maddie Mogan's bedroom. He finds inside that bedroom, not just Maddie, but Kaylee. He had really no idea that, that Kaylee w was there. She's not really living in the house anymore. She's up in, in North and Coeur d'Alene. Uh, she's getting ready to graduate and she's doing an internship there. Uh, so I believe that he had one point in the Mad Greek restaurant where he would go for, which is in downtown Moscow, uh, Moscow. He, he goes there for vegan food. He met Maddie. He didn't even have to talk with her. He was a man who was prone to obsessions. His heroin addiction, uh, his decision to lose 125 pounds, uh, his decision to go from uh, a low-ranking community college to a top-ranking graduate school in criminology. He threw himself into things. And for some reason, her beauty, her exuberance, her vitality, uh, her blondness even, that attracted uh, Brian Koberg, I believe. You know, a killer... You know, he, he, made, he made all of this up. Right. He feels this. He has no evidence of it. So, I mean, how could, you know, why is he getting all this traction then? He feels this. There's no evidence. And he, was there ever any evidence that he used to go into the mad Greek restaurant and order vegan food? I, I thought that was sort of uh, disqualified also. So where is this? These are his feelings. And for that, you write a novel and putting it out there almost. And his people are interviewing him as if he knows what direction this the killer took because he feels it. You know, though that's a, that's called a hunch, Mike. And I used to get them when I was on a police department. I'd have a hunch, but you know something? Many of my hunches weren't didn't come true. And many of I used to have a detective that was always hypothesizing and theorizing. And most of his hypothesizing and theorizing theories weren't true. They never came true. So he's writing a book about this and just because he feels it. And I, I, I don't, I'm not getting it. Are you getting it, Mike? Billy, he's a, he's an excellent writer, uh, but I'm not getting it because every time you have a theory you have, and you want to prove that theory, you have to have some sort of research and concrete evidence, not just a, uh, a, 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 a hypothesis and then a theory and then some other a feeling and an instinct and a tuition, intuition. No, that's really great that he's thinking of all these things, but do not write it in a book and try to try to sell it as this is I you know I've I've gone out there with my trench coat and I solved the case. 
Don't when, I, when I heard that, I wanted to almost vomit. I want to cry. You want to cry out there with his friend. You know, part of that when my one detective used to say, I would say, Joe, I to use his first name, not his last name. Joe, stop hypothesizing and theorizing and start typerizing your reports. You know, right. because you're doing a lot of hypothesization and theorizing, but it means nothing unless we have evidence to prove your hypothesis. And your theory is absolutely true. And guess what? It's not. Let me play a little more of this and then we'll dissect it. He needs two things, someone to love and someone to hate. And either he loved the image that she projected so much and hated himself for being on the outside of it, or he hated her and felt she was a constant rebuke to everything that he was trying to become. Why do you say that? Because first of all, and to back up and to be clear, you're not suggesting that anybody who has some sort of drug addiction will have an obsession with a person, right? They might be, they might have an addiction to a drug. It doesn't mean they're obsessed with, there's I, something I specific think about, a, obsessive, something about Coburg. An obsessive personality. Okay. I think you can see a, a pattern uh, of a personality that falls into obsessive beliefs, obsessive behavior. And, and that's been the story of his life. And for whatever reason, and, you know, I wish... I wish I could speak with him. Uh, I'd like. Have you to, tried? Uh, I've tried everything. It, it's pretty hard to get to Brian Coburn right now. He won't say anything now. while this is legal cases going and, on. And I don't think he's he's allowed to by the gag order. Right. Right. Uh, that's another problem with this case. To digress for a second, this gag order uh, is so restrictive that it's allowed anyone with any knowledge to speak on the record. Anyone I spoke to, I had to speak to off the record, and in this vacuum. Uh, of authoritative comments on the case, the vacuum is filled with half-truths, lies, innuendos, and outright vicious accusations that fill the internet.